Welcome to uh, What Has the Environment Ever Done For Us? And uh, this seems to be our fifth or sixth episode. I think it's our fifth. And now we're moving on to the lofty discussions of transport and how we move around this world uh, in a different way. But we're going to focus on uh, transport across the country, on roads and highways. And uh, we've got two amazing guests who are going to help us navigate that uh, journey today. Uh, with me, uh, as ever, is uh, Keith Mitchell, uh, Jonathan Riggle, uh, Vicky Slade. Uh, we were going to have Jenny uh, Hughes, who's one of our regulars, but she had a better offer. And all of us are just going to take our time to find out what could be better than being with us this afternoon. But, you know, we'll get there eventually. Uh, one of our guests um, is... Uh, uh, Greg Marsden, who's Professor of Transport Governance at the Institute of Transport Studies at the University of Leeds, and he's the Network Director of Decarbonate, which got me straight into Dr. Hugh, Dr. Who, um, not Dr. Hugh, and James Birch joins us. Um, James is the um, Managing Director of Kia Highways, the local side, and he is in charge of making sure that we can drive neatly, tidily, down a road with as few potholes as possible. And he makes politicians terribly excited with his pothole repairing machines. Who, who could want for more of a job than having a potholing machine uh, going around the country? So what we're gonna start off is, is our normal routine of going through the news. And um, Johnny, uh, I understand that you've calmed down a lot, but a few uh, politicians wound you up a little bit. Why was that? Ah, well. It wasn't the politicians, it was the response by a small number of scientists who use this expressions, expression that you see a lot nowadays, scientists say. Uh, it's the general use of the word scientist to justify a statement. Uh, and just because a scientist says it doesn't mean it's true. Uh, but I've calmed down, Nick. Uh, and as a scientist and a geographer, uh, I'm just going to make sure that I don't start sentences with uh, scientists say. Um, so, so the background to this, though, was last week was the uh, World Climate Summit, where 40 uh, of the leading countries came together on a mega teams call. I, I didn't find out whether they use Zoom or Teams or, or what, what structure they use uh, to talk about uh, their collective obligations towards climate change. And it was a real kind of like a, a pre pre a pre 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 call to COP26 in November. Um, what we saw was uh, countries coming forth and redefining their nationally determined contributions and their targets that they are, are, are going to apply to. So we saw Boris Johnson, uh, who used, he's gone from mung beans to bunny huggers now. Uh, so I know I, it's, it kind of marginally amuses me, but it's, uh, it's pretty uh, derisory to the environment sector that we get lumped into being bug, buggy, uh, bunny huggers. Um, uh, re regaling the 78% uh, reduction by 2035, which is the UK Climate Change Committee recommendation. So he's taken that recommendation on. Uh, the United States uh, have stated their, their targets uh, roughly around 50% um, compared to their 2005 levels uh, by 2030. Uh, Canada, fairly similar, 45% roughly uh, by 2030. Australia, slightly lower, 25%. Uh, uh, by 2030. But herein is an interesting conversation that ensued out the back end. These are just targets. There's no substance behind them. Although the United States did come out with a very, very long list of uh, active activities that they will be undertaking, finance mechanisms, which was really good to see them at the table and, and really putting a flag in the ground there. Um, some of the articles that came out, one in particular that you mentioned beforehand, uh, was doing a lot of finger pointing about how do you achieve a 78% percent reduction by 2035 and pointing out uh, the elephants in the room in fact there's so many elephants I think we've now got a sanctuary uh, rather than just uh, one elephant in the room uh, and I think it's quite a nice way of thinking this this sanctuary of elephants that we've got but it really doesn't help anybody continually pointing out the problems that we all know exist already and I think really it's time for scientists to knuckle down rather than pointing out the kind of potential failures of not achieving it or work towards the actual activities we need to achieve these outcomes. Um, it's, it doesn't really help uh, matters, just pointing out the problems. Um, not least, uh, you know, some of the big elephants in the room uh, associated with, um, there was an article or a, a paper written by the United Nations at the end of last year, December uh, 2020, 
uh, with regards to you know, showing some of the massive gaps in terms of emissions between those who have and those who don't have. Uh, One percent of the most affluent people in the world uh, have doubled the carbon footprint compared to the bottom 50 percent. Um, so when it comes to making changes, you know, the changes need to be specific and bespoke to particular demographics. Yes, there will be a lot of lifestyle changes, but probably more likely lifestyle changes to those at that top 1% and not those at the bottom 50%. Uh, and that's a really key thing that the messages that need to get out, not least and bring us into the topic of conversation today, transport. You can see how uh, people who have a large house, you know, if you've got two people living in a 10 bedroom house, they're going to have a bigger carbon footprint than five people living in a one bedroom house. Uh, if you've got two or three cars, if you've got a very, very large SUV because it shows your affluence and your, your sense of purpose and ego. Look at me, I've got a very big car, aren't I important? Um, those are the types of lifestyle changes that are probably going to need to be changed. Um, so when we come onto transport and we look at the transport system and structure, if we're going to change lifestyles, how does the transport infrastructure change to meet that? Are we going to have people in single vehicles, very large vehicles, 30 miles per gallon, spewing out diesel fumes, petrol fumes, or everything going to be completely different. And I think at this point, I will pass over to, uh, to Vicky and Keith to pick up that mantle on, so what will transport look like and how will it adapt to a future related to climate change? Johnny, it's interesting you hate the term scientists say, because I hate the phrase politicians do or don't or lie or whatever. Um, you know, the scientist is a pretty broad um, church, shall we say, uh, and the same is true for politicians, you know, that we obviously um, go by uh, various other negative phrases, and I can't bear it when we're lumped together either, so, um, you know, I'm with you on that one. Um, as, as Nick already introduced um, James and Greg, um, it, it's quite interesting you, you should talk about um, the, the targets versus the reality, because... Um, I was uh, talking to, to Greg last month and, and reading one of the papers that he's written, which we'll, sure we'll come on to, and he was talking about the disconnect between policy goals and policy actions. Um, and it feels like what happened last week was another set of goals, um, but with Amer America aside, not a lot of action. So it'd be interesting to see what comes out, perhaps, as we approach COP26. Um, just a couple of facts to get us going. 21%, a fifth of our greenhouse gases come from transport in this country. And uh, can you believe it? in 2019, there was a 2% increase just in that one year in the number of cars. Um, this is obviously the year before COVID. Um, but the market share of new EVs is only 14%. So electric vehicles that they're going, ramping up, but are they the solution? I don't. I don't know. I'm hoping that that Greg and James will will, will help us understand whether behaviour change is the key, or or is it actually about alternative fuels, alternative ways of, of driving? So we've already introduced um, um, both James and Greg, but we're gonna, I'm going to start by asking Greg a few questions because Greg, um, you've got a really interesting background. Um, your sort of escalation from research to professor. Um, by the Institute. Tell us a bit about what, I mean, why transport? Have you always been, uh, were you, did you start life as a petrol head or, or a, a now a, a cyclist or have you always been, you know, on the sort of um, active transport sort of journey? Um, I came into my career through civil engineering. Um, so I did a civil engineering degree at, at Nottingham, did a couple of um, summer placements on on site with land construction learned uh, a lot of bad language uh, during that time um, and then uh, just took some transport options in in my final year um, got really interested in that and then did a, a PhD in, in urban air quality as it uh, was a big issue back in the mid 1990s a lot of people thought it would be solved by now because of the technology uh, and here we are in 2020 still with massive urban air quality problems and that's maybe a, um, an interesting rider to kind of just put out there what we imagine is is possible uh, and deliverable through technology uh, and, and we kind of bet and rely on that saving us in, down the line but it doesn't always play out that and it's way. interesting that it's taken all that time to get the first um the, the first um inquest to confirm a death as a direct result of, of 
air quality with with that um, young girl last year. You know, so that's a that's a massive long journey before we actually see that taken seriously. Um, is that surprising to you that that's taken so long? And do you think that's going to drive more decision making change in in sort of government? I think it's a really important um, legal precedent. I mean, it's surprising given that we've known that it's 40,000 plus, you know, early deaths a year that have been caused by by air quality. And that's been known since the 1990s. And yet we've been we've been sort of OK letting that happen, um, you know, promising slow improvements. Um, and when you compare that with the scale of response to to COVID, you do you know, you can't help but conclude that we've just been pretty complacent about um, actually the health impacts and, and the health impacts on, on the poorest, you know, who tend to be disproportionately affected by uh, urban air quality because they live near the busiest roads uh, and they're not the ones that are driving the cars through those, those busiest areas a lot of the time. It is ironic, isn't it, when we, we see the objections against the sort of the low traffic neighbourhoods and we see the objections to the cycle lanes and things like that, that actually um, you talk to people who live within them and it primarily that they support them because actually their, their quality of life, their air quality is improved. It is the people who are trying to, um, you know, save 2.2 minutes on their on their journey, which they didn't need to make in the first place. Um, that, you you talked about um, in one of your recent studies about um, the potential we have if the behaviour changes from COVID, uh, more people working from home when we all return to the offices, we have the potential to have a permanent half term congestion level, which anyone who's ever tried to go out and noticed and wondered why on earth the traffic has suddenly disappeared but doesn't have kids are like aha. Uh -huh. It must be half term. Um, do you do you think that that's true? Do you think there's enough capacity in behaviour change to to shift that congestion downwards? And if you do, what impact does that have on our need for those roads? Um, okay, so whether you whether you believe it or not, it's a really interesting one. We're all perfectly prepared to believe that we can have 100% electrification and we can sort out goods vehicles and all these other things. So we don't even have technological solutions for and yet when it comes to behavior change we're all sort of like well do you think we could do you think well, will people accept that you know <laughs> so we're prepared to imagine all sorts of things in one area and, and 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 find it difficult in the other so the reason we 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 kind of did the calculations on on the covid things we, we've got this long longitudinal study going on and um you know it's obvious that not everyone's going to want to continue to stay at home all of the time it does get incredibly dull at times doesn't it and, you know and people want to go and meet for certain for certain things i think meeting face to face we you know it's reinforced our value of it but for other things it's opened up opportunities to you know would we have been doing this pre covid possibly not you know but but this sort of thing has become normal and we're now exchanging in in all sorts of different ways anyway we we just thought you know for those people who used to drive uh, and have been working from home what if they stayed at home two days a week and that gives you the half term effect and that, that to me doesn't feel like it's an outrageous ask of the population and it doesn't feel like it's unworkable and it feels like a tangible benefit that we could all work with so you know why can't we grab hold of that and, and I'm really surprised by just how um, vacant the message has been in, in central government about this it's um, you know the uh, simple messages but let's get the economy moving let's get people back into city centers you know it it just feels like we're missing like a a golden opportunity to reinforce some of what's going to happen whether we have policy for it or not the question is do we try and do we try and create something really good here or or, or do we yeah. let it slide I, by i suppose if you also combine that with um reducing the impact of the school run itself um, because, you know, the number of people, I mean, I, I saw a, a cartoon today about, um, you know, parents driving their, their small child to school in a great big SUV. Um, I was commenting on the fact my, my kids cycle to school have done since they were nine. If, if you can have a small shift in the school run as well, then actually it could be like the summer holidays, you know, all year round, which would be even better. 
yeah, we don't we haven't seen any evidence of that so far in our data that people no, even though people have been at home more, they have not necessarily done more of the school run in more sustainable ways. Although, you know, these are pretty odd times, aren't they? So I wouldn't go too early with what you know, whether that evidence is conclusive or not. I don't know what the scientists say, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> what does the scientist I'll say, ask Johnny? them all at the same time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Greg, it, it, the, the, uh, what interests me about your conclusion there is that if, 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 if we are to take more seriously the potential for some elements of behaviour change to stick, uh, and we want to try and in, uh, to um, uh, recover the economy back from where, where whence it came. What what does a government do? Because at the moment it seems to me that you're saying in 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 your work in uh, at, uh, at a crossroads um, that we're saying uh, we've at the moment we've got a government who wants to build back build back anything actually because that's good for the economy. But building back better needs us to rethink what it is that we're building and we're just we don't seem to be doing that at the moment and and so so my question would be if 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 you were in their shoes what would you be looking at what would you be trying to get them to rethink and what does that mean for us as industry professionals you know that's something i think we need to start thinking about so i i think the the obvious area to invest in we need more people to walk and cycle we need more people to use the bus and public transport, and we need fewer people driving. And I haven't seen a climate analysis from any local authority, regional or subnational transport body that doesn't come to that conclusion. Given what we've just gone through with a kind of public health emergency, we need more people to be out and about healthy and active. So I think the sensible thing to do would be to repurpose the funding we've got in the transport sector and put it more locally. I mean, James will know what the scale of the, um, the infrastructure maintenance backlog is. Let's not see it as a maintenance backlog. Let's see it as a massive urban renewal programme where repurposing all of the, the, the streets is, is thought through in, in, in the way that we can, you know, generate the best kind of total social outcomes, rather than just putting the roads back the way that we, we have done in a low, you know, as low a cost as, as we can. And yeah. that will create lots of jobs. It's also opens up, I think, opportunities to smaller contractors that that kind of big infrastructure projects don't, you know, I think that that's, you know, it's not an, a non economic uh, growth investment to to do that, but I think going down the well 27 billion on on RIS two, when we've just proved that we can do a lot of what we, we used to do without travelling, I mean how how is that actually going to grow the economy? I, I, I'm 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 struggling to see the logic that follows. Ne yeah. Never mind the carbon implications that would follow. Yeah, I, th I think it was something that we did, we covered a bit uh, last month uh, talking about. Uh, the challenge to the roads investment strategy um, and the potential that that has for changing the way um, government policy is targeted at transport infrastructure at the moment. I think, you know, but what I haven't yet seen, and James, perhaps you might be seeing this in the local uh, infrastructure delivery market, is any sense that that's a, an active discussion up between contractors, local authorities? Is that something that you're beginning to see? We, we are, yeah, we certainly are. I mean, I think there will always be a need for a highway network. Um, it's the cornerstone of the economy um, and will continue to be so. We, we do move a lot by road. Um, I think what will change and what needs to change is, as you said, Greg, the way people use it and the types of vehicles moving on, on the network. Um, eventually, where there won't be fossil fuel vehicles, um, there'll be different types of electric, hydrogen powered vehicles, HVOs, and there's likely to be more non motorised users, i.e., electric scooters, uh, and probably more communal travel, um, sort of electric sh shuttle buses and the like. We're starting to see, certainly in London, we do a lot of work in London, we're starting to see um, big investments in active travel. So cycle superhighways, um, <clears throat> walking, um, shared spaces, 
Um, and I think most of our local authority clients are, are moving towards not just putting back the road as it always was, but looking at walking, looking at cycling, um, looking at more infrastructure around bus lanes and, and making public transport more accessible, more feasible. So we are seeing a lot of different types of works come through to what we deliver in the local market. So working with local authorities on the local road network. Um, I think if you look at the Highways England road network, um, that will change as well. Um, I think Highways England have committed quite a lot in terms of how they will be looking at the electric charging infrastructure and, and never being too far away from electric charging points and that kind of thing to, to look at changing the modal shift to, to non-fossil fuel vehicles. Um, but, but yeah, we are certainly seeing the local authorities we work with um, looking at that modal shift and now starting to invest more in rather than just resurface the road as it's always been resurfaced and fill the potholes, which they need to do but taking the opportunity to um, to look at different uses of the network as well and, and get more into the network. So, so we are seeing a change, yes. Yeah, I mean, that, that's really interesting. Sorry, Vicky. You're on mute, You're Vicky. On mute. <laughs> that's that's hey. the husband just came back in to deal with our bees. Um, <laughs> uh, James, I'm interested in how you see, so, so absolutely we need to look at the behaviour change and we need to shift some of the, the, the road usage, but how do you see the inevitable changes in our climate patterns affecting the road network both in terms of the impact of the you know from flooding and whatever and and how how you behave in terms of whether you repair or replace yeah. is it going yeah. to become more complicated um, I think it's always been complicated and I think as you said um, at the beginning I probably frustrate a lot of um, politicians by by talking about it. it's not just filling a pothole there's more to it than filling the pothole and, and, and that kind of thing and the infrastructure that goes around and how we fill potholes but yeah you're right I mean as a business um, we've completed a climate change risk assessment and it's highlighted a number of risks um, and makes recommendations on what we need to do around climate change so I think more obvious changes are related to extreme weather as you, as you said there so heat wave events for example could cause um, could increase wildfires on the highway verge so we should be looking at um, changes to the way we maintain soft estate regimes, sort of including fire breaks in high risk areas, that kind of things, uh, heathlands and, and gorse. Um, training frontline staff on what to do if they um, if they identify a wildfire. So there's, there's a lot of things that we do that go on behind the scenes around climate change and, and how it will impact us on the front line. Um, flooding, um, yeah, very big. Uh, and I think there's two things here. There's one is around future proofing the future network. So when we design and build new roads and we design and build new infrastructure improvements, looking at um, uh, how we better deal with flood events. So, so more use of, of suds, increasing our drainage capacity and a better understanding uh, use and investment in the highway verge and how green infrastructure provides those vital ecosystems that we'll deal with, that we'll deal with, um, that we'll deal with storms. I, I think a bigger part of what we do certainly across the network is around winter maintenance and this has always been an interesting one because when you think of winter maintenance you think of it's going to get cold you need to grit the roads um, we do but what we're seeing and what we've seen over sort of a number of our contract um, profiles is that we have a fixed winter season that's kind of end of end of october to, to, to begin of april whereby we have a um, um, we, we're, we're contracted to grit the roads we're now seeing it being milder and wetter in october november december so we've got inefficiencies where we're not gritting, but we should be looking at um, flood, flood, resist, flood, um, flood relief system. So in Shropshire, we had a, some immense flooding, as you'll be aware, last winter, where while we were, I guess, geared up to an extent to be out gritting, and we were out giving out sandbags and, and doing flood relief. Um, and then I think as you look at now, we're, what, we were coming up to May, and it's still minus two in the morning. So, so we're out gritting more now. Um, so I think there's... Um, a big thing around how we traditionally look at the seasons, certainly from a highways maintenance point of view, um, to need to work more of our clients and to not just develop those winter maintenance plans, but look at severe weather plans, much more, as I said, focusing on, on flooding, the, the freeze, thaw, and then looking at how we, not quite modal shift, but how we shift our response to the change of weather conditions. And, and, and I, I mean, we go on to the Marks and Spencer's thing about the bees and the wrong type of bees and that kind of thing. But a lot of our softer state, we're now looking at, certainly on the Highways England network, can we plant different things and rebuild ecosystems to, to, to regenerate that? Because, I mean, as we know, the, the bees create most of the things that we that we have um, without them, there won't be much left. So there's a lot of thinking around how do we react to a climate emergency? Uh, a number of local authorities have obviously um, now announced um, climate emergencies. So there's a lot of work going 
heard all of our clients about how we do change the way we provide our service. Um, the whole freeze four pattern with, with filling potholes, I won't bore you with the, 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 the technical side of that. But yes, we are looking at different pothole machines. Um, we're looking at different ways to fill roads. We're looking at reusing the existing material um, and putting it back into the roads, again, to reduce that carbon footprint and looking at how we can reduce the impact from, from our operations. Um, so, so yeah, there is a lot of things about Greg, I mean, you, it, it's not just, I mean, you talk about severe weather. One of the biggest excuses that we hear um, as, as sort of, uh, you know, local, local community champions, let's call us that and not politicians, is, well, we can't all get on our bikes and walk because it rains a lot here and, and we have hills and it's windy. And I read today that actually the part of the Netherlands that has the biggest capacity in bicycles is the most hilly now i'm sure comparatively it's not you know like the uk um but i'm just wondering apart from you know simply making that change to work at home and and, and shift over what are the changes in our place making do we need to do around around decarbonizing transport um i absolutely hate the absolutism of the arguments that we end up in in, in transport it's too hilly it's too wet nobody's saying that everyone has to cycle every day of the year for every activity that they undertake you know if everyone did 20 percent fewer trips by car particularly those in the top three income you know quintiles or, or our top half of our earners were using the car one day a week less it would make a huge difference to to mileage so um you know that 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 to me is you know the way we frame the the whole yeah. discussion is part of the problem. It, it ends up ruling stuff out, you know, before we've even had a sensible discussion about well what what it would mean. But we also frame the discussion very much around, uh, as we have been today actually, about car users versus um, public transport users versus active travel. Uh, you know, rather than you know, normal human beings who do a bit of this and do a bit of that and do a bit of the other. Um, uh, and actually, um, uh, also part, the other part of the argument, which is uh, around invest, continued investment in rail uh, and public transport post pandemic, uh, and the extent to which that will continue to play a, a fundamental role in the future carbon, you know, decarbonized transport network. Uh, and how the and how the how our road system ought to be playing a subsidiary part of that wider uh, national network of, of strategic connections. There doesn't seem to be that sort of debate about uh, about the complexity of our transport systems. It seems to be very dogmatically about one or the other. But one of the things that I'm I'm interested in listening to all of what you're saying is <clears throat> one of our uh, viewers has um, brought up about. Uh, the government's problem with wanting everyone to spend money on retail. Uh, if the, the, the level of traffic is reduced and it's easier to move around locally uh, and more of a sustaining local, then all our town centres that actually have lost tremendous amount of um, activity could be the beneficiaries, which would change the use of local roads and maybe take the level of usage of the major network uh, down considerably as we're not going into London. I'm quite intrigued that I, I don't hear people talk, the, the trains are empty. You know, I went up to London last week and it was nice to have a carriage to myself. And um, that's a huge opportunity. The, the marketing of that availability is, it is a huge opportunity for us to have better roads and parking again in our town centres because we're actually starting to live in our town centres again. Uh, do you think that, that we're, we're, we're you, you made a comment earlier, Craig, that politicians weren't listening to the, the opportunity. Um, do you think that we're missing a trick that we've just not realised what's happened around us enough? I think it, this, this is a really interesting and difficult one, right? Because, um, you know, there are some businesses that are really going to suffer as a result of, uh, you know, lower footfall. If, if, you know, if people do commute into their place of work less frequently, then, you know, the the kind of um, service retail catering industry around that kind of office based work, you know, mm. is not going to be quite as big as it as it was. Um, we might see some downsizing of offices over time, although that's 
you know it's a bit sticky the the market people have got leases and so on that take a while to adjust but you know those places like city centers and town centers are the most accessible bits of our you know of our country um they're really well located for all sorts of public transport and intercity connectivity if we could make them you know open to um a more diverse set of people who want to live in them if we can put some green space investment back into city centers then you know i think there would be a, a real benefit and it would make those places again you know it would help with their revitalization i i just i can't see us going back to to the previous scale of retail in in town and city centers i mean we we jumped from like 17 percent of stuff being bought online by value to 35 percent during the pandemic yeah it's going to go back again you know there's big queues outside primark and whatever but you know it's going to go back to what 25 percent you know 30 percent we've that's gone now it's not i can't see that coming back so what are we going to do we need to we need to jump on it and capitalize and that's the part of the problem i think this is what johnny was getting to earlier you know like well we've got to do stuff now we've not we you know yeah. we've got we've got to see those opportunities and make them happen in the next five or ten years we can't wait ten years for stuff to to happen and so what and so what do we do though about local people who feel feel very uncomfortable about that transition because vicky you know in her role is facing people who are who are gay who are who are very unhappy about seeing change without necessarily feeling as though they're being consulted on it you know th that there is that tension isn't there but it can i just add before greg comes up with his solution just to bring james <laughs> in as well is is it isn't just about being unhappy about it it's about the fact that when a road gets resurfaced typically the pavement doesn't i mean i i'm a i've, I've now taken up a lot of cycling and walking and uh, honestly i'm lucky i've still got all my own teeth the amount of dodgy routes that are coming through all of the pavements I need to sign, you know, these shared pavements. And yet you look at the road, beautifully smooth. So, you know, elderly people, people who are trying to go to bikes, people who wouldn't, uh, not the light for a clad brigade, the everyday resident who wants to get on a bike is being put off doing so because the state of the pavements and cycleways aren't matched as, as the road. So I think there's an element there for James as well in terms of, when we're looking at infrastructure, it, it, the hierarchy is, is 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 mismatched. Well, maybe this is where the the yeah. kind of um, promising jam tomorrow is, is the problem with 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 all of the carbon targets. You know, actually, you know, in Leeds they say 130% more public transport, uh, bus. 100% more rail, 400% more cycling, 33% more walking, 30% less car use by 2030, and that gets us 43% of our way to our to our carbon target, right? So, what kind of a conversation have we had with the with the public about the scale of this challenge? We haven't. We've told them that they should get an electric vehicle, and then we're surprised when things kick off. You know, we just haven't had a like we if it's an emergency then it's you know it's on a scale that's not just completely incompatible with what what the political dialogue i think at a national scale is generally saying and that's not to say there aren't some really good things being done by government but there's no that they're, they're not going there in terms of the you know the scale of the behavior change that, that needs to be that needs to be achieved James, would you agree with that? I mean, are you are you getting a sense from the councils you're working with that they feel there's a real emergency or does it feel like a tick in the box and it's, well, we've done a few kilometres of cycleway, but that's, that's done. Yeah, I, I certainly doesn't, it doesn't feel to me with, um, with our clients a tick in the box by any means. Um, I think the difficulty is, is um, but budgets are, are, are finite and certainly revenue budgets are shrinking. Um, capital investment costs money, obviously. Um, and, and I think um, if you take an asset led approach, which to be fair, I think uh, in my background prior to joining the, the private sector side of, of contracting was in local authorities and, and was, was dealing with asset management and, and looking at asset led approaches and, and how we can get the best out of the network for the longest period of time. Um, I think there is still, um, a need to treat the carriageway network because of the sheer volume of vehicles that it carries and, and will continue to carry. Um, 
And I think trying to balance that, I think local authorities are getting a lot better and a lot smarter with their spending um, to look at the subsidiary infrastructure, sort of walking and cycling facilities as well. But it's difficult because there's a finite pot of money to, to, to deliver these works. Um, I think the more um, intelligent clients, um, if, if you like, the ones that are further ahead along on their asset approach, are now looking at preventative methods. So it costs less to maintain a road if it's been preventatively treated than it does to start again and reconstruct the whole thing. And um, over a period of time, those budgets will last longer. But I think we've just got to juggle that the, the financing stresses around how do we maintain this great big vast asset, which um, would is worth billions um, at, with, with a finite pot of money. So I can see and I sympathise with um, local authorities because it is difficult to, to maintain everything, unfortunately. But I am seeing... Um, I am seeing more investment in footways and cycling, certainly in the urban areas. Um, then comes the question of how do you link a rural, area, uh, a rural area to an urban area to allow that journey to continue on cycle or, or walking. Um, it's not an easy nut to crack. But just, just sort of rounding it off then, be, um, before we start looking at some of our other, other interesting things, and I'd, I'd encourage you both to join in with our thinking on our, our heroes and hypocrisy around, uh, around um, the climate and bearing in mind that hypocrisy is better than no action at all. We agreed a few months ago, you know, so you can't get it right first time every time. We've talked about the legal challenge around the road infrastructure is too. Um, and obviously that's bumbling, you know, bumbling along. What about local plans? I, I have a, 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 a nervousness with, um, with the government wanting, all local authorities have new local plans over the next two or three years. Um, I'm really interested in where energy fits into the local plans and, and there's not enough talk about local provision of energy. But are we going to see people like Client Earth and others taking local authorities to court or preventing the adoption of local plans because they haven't really got to grips with the net, you know, the, the net zero? If Greg says, even with all the incredible work being done at Leeds, and I've, I've talked to Leeds, they really are top of their game in terms of sustainability. If even they're only going to get to 43%, what about the rest of them? Surely we're just going to see them all blocked up in the courts. Well, how do you both feel about, about that possibility? Or is it is it just a case of, we'll have to wait and see? Um, really good question. Um, I mean, for, for Leeds, I think, part of the problem is they've gone for a political target which is zero by 2030 we're still selling petrol engine vehicles now and will be until 2029 so the chances of being zero by 2030 feel to me enormously slim so i think there's um you know in a sense a lot of authorities have wanted to show to their communities that they're committed to this and they've gone ambitious and early, you know, 2028 um, was the, is the earliest I've heard that we're going to have zero, but maybe you can, you can better that. It's not a game show, but um, <laughs> well, it wouldn't be a great well, show, it? but, but you know, um, <laughs> so, we'll be allowed to win a brand new car as a prize. Well, you? yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. A caravan or a speedboat. Yeah. Um, but so, you know, they've, they've set themselves up, but if you, you know, if you've, if you've chosen 2030 as your year where you're going to be zero, then how can you have a plan which is inconsistent with that, which you want your citizens to sign off to say where, where the house building is going to be? And that, at the end of the day, is what we're saying with the climate emergency and the carbon budgets, is that this is the amount of carbon that we've got. And if it doesn't fit, why are you bringing that forward as a plan? Imagine someone putting a congestion reduction plan forward that only increased congestion. I mean, actually, we've had that before by national government. But, you know, but, you know, the idea of setting out deliberately strategies that are, are not going to do what they what, what they have to. I just yeah. I so so but so the, if you were to turn this on its head, uh, would this be an opportunity for uh, local authorities to really engage with their communities about their local plan, about what it would take from a development and infrastructure point of view to get to net zero in terms of the technologies that they're supporting, 
uh, the adaptation of their infrastructure, the nature of the housing development, what's happening in their high street, all of those different factors all combining into a net zero plan or as close as they could get to it. You know, that should, seems to, to be one, of, one way of being able to sort of close that circle from where we started this conversation about there having been no debate about it and just go and buy an electric vehicle uh, to you know, actually having a plan around how you engage communities in that transition. I think that would be a great move. And I think also to, to do it with, you know, the business community as well about, you know, the sorts of uh, contracting that's going to be done, the sorts of, um, you know, house building that, that needs to be done. Like who are the part, who's going to work with us in, in, in this framing of what we need to do for the next decade? You know, come forward. We're interested in working with you, but it's going to have to look like this. Yeah, I think that would be a, you know, we, but we, yeah, without that honest kind of framing, you know, why would you make the difficult choices? Because we've never really said that we have to. Yeah. And can I, so, so on that, in that, in that vein, I've got a question for James and, and then with the same question, but a little bit more for, for you, Greg. So, so one of the things that, that we always talk about is skills and the skills agenda. Um, and to point out more elephants in our sanctuary that we're building here. Um, do we have the skills to be able to convert our road networks into, and as Greg called it, you know, the urban renewal program in order to get to 2030, so was it nine years, eight and a half years time, are, is your world, James, ready to, change, to make that fundamental in every city, in every town in the United Kingdom? And based on James's answer, Greg, with a fair win, with all the right things, when we'll get to an outcome that could be net zero from a transport perspective. But, uh, but James. Yeah, so I think um, if I can sort of give a very short synopsis of how I ended up in this chair today, knowing nothing at all about sustainability and environment about a year ago, but being, I guess, a fairly senior business leader within Key Highways with, with, a, with a background in, in local authorities, operational delivery, um, building roads safely um, and at commercially sustainable delivery to have a, to have a successful business. Um, fast forward to where I am now as the sustainability lead and executive sponsor for the whole of highways business. So I look after about a third of the highways business in Kia, in, in Kia Group, but I'm the sustainability uh, exec sponsor for the whole of highways. So I have to look after the, the strategic highways, uh, Highways England, which is the, the bigger part of the business um, that I'm not operationally involved in. Um, and the reason I am now involved is because I think we have got some, and not just us, um, our, our peers, our competitors, um, our clients have got some very good people that have been alive and awake to this for quite some time, but trying to bring business leaders. And I think if you, if you look at where we are with our chief executive, who is an absolute um, pioneer of what we're doing in the sustainability space and, and, and has been driving our sustainability strategy for the last sort of six, 12, 18 months. Um, I'm involved because the people that know about this stuff and have got the skills um, needed a senior leadership voice to take this forward um, and start putting our money where our mouth is, really. So we need to invest. And, and we've, we had a, a call with Energize who are helping us out with our with our carbon um, data. And, and the challenge I put to them was, well, what does this mean? Because, you know, with data, if you put rubbish in, you get rubbish out. Is the data we've got good? Because I can only make good decisions if I've got good data. And the skills um, are there. Um, the, the environmental team, we've got the sustainability team, um, the, the social value side of things. We, we've got some good brains on this. Um, we're being pushed very hard by our clients. We're being pushed very hard by our prospective clients through procurements to um, not just tell them how good we are at filling potholes and building bridges, but more importantly, what are we doing about local skill shortages? How are we investing in young people? What are we doing around the social value piece? Because this is all part of sustainability. So sustainability is not just about carbon. Obviously, we're talking about carbon. But um, I don't think it's acceptable to any client that we're looking to do business with just to say we're going to have an electric fleet. That's, that's expected. That's not new. That's not going to get us to net zero by 2030, 2035, 2040, 2045. Um, but there is some good stuff going on around, around the whole piece, so around the ecology side of things, around the social enterprises, around, around bringing skills into the industry. Um, I use the analogy in my other hat with my ED and I hound that, that, that talks about if you're always going to do what you've always done, you're always going to get what you've always got. And, and we refer to Nokia and then Apple coming along and building new mobile phones, et cetera, et cetera. So we're looking at um, universities. We're doing a lot of work in Guildford. 
um, with, with, with the University of Guildford. Um, I think we've been talking to Leeds University as well um, in some capacity. Um, we're looking at a lot of, sort of knowledge transfer partnerships around how we can bring graduates into our business to tell us how to do things differently. Um, working with British Safety Council um, previously around air quality monitoring. So there's a lot of stuff that goes above and beyond filling potholes. So a very long winded way of saying, yes, I think the skills do exist. Uh, we need to invest in the skills or they'll disappear and go and work for, Gil for Google or, or Amazon or someone. Um, so we're in, we're in a sort of a hiatus at the moment within our issue because we've got to attract good and different people to our industry. It's not all about being bridge engineers. We've got good bridge engineers. We need good sustainability champions and people that know how to drive our business differently, make use of the data and support our clients to, to, to build on our aspirations of being net zero um, or we won't do it. Greg, so, so with that in mind, we can, we can build it. Will they come? You mean will we will we get to our net zero commitments? Will we will we yeah will we get to our net zero commitments for trans for transport in particular? Will we see that uh, evolutionary change of demographics, attitudes to ownership of single car occupancy? Uh, will we move on beyond the the diesel bus and being choking behind it as you cycle into an urban centre? Once all of that's been dealt with, when when do you think? What date would you give it? Um. I guess it's not the date; it's the it's the pathway. Oh, good answer. Yeah, because <laughs> electrification is going to happen, and once we get electrification, if we've got um, you know green green energy supplying it, then the constraints around infrastructure and everything else begin to diminish. But only if we take the action that we need to in the next decade or on on the way up to ramping up to electrification. Um, that keeps us within our budget. So I'm I'm actually quite um, pessimistic about that, and um, you know I don't, but I don't think we get anywhere by by just talking about the really good stuff that's happening. We've got to face up to the you know the fact that we we don't have a full set of, of policies in place. We're still putting stuff in the wrong place. We're still making the car cheaper relative to public transport, and we're still imagining that that's going to deliver us a mode shift that we say we require. So I don't think that the strategies that are there at the moment, they, they say what we would need to have in place, but they are not strategies that, that get us there. And um, that's probably what gets you annoyed uh, at the weekends. I think bringing it a bit back to where we started about politicians say, um, you know, we, we had this crazy situation, didn't we, in the budget where they froze fuel duty, but allowed train fares to go up. We've just, in our local council, had our climate plan, um, went out for consultation and, and the questionnaire came back and we've just put in a, a, pl a planning document that says um, that cars and uh, homes in the town centres won't need car parking. Of course, the, 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 the people who replied, uh, oh, we don't like that. So now the council going, well, perhaps we better not do that then. Um, it's this constant need to please today's voter um it is is really holding us back isn't it we you know we've, we've got to just say if, if we believe that this is an emergency we have to act and we've all got to we've all got to change that behavior i think two days a week at home if we can have a permanent half-term holiday that's that to me is a absolute game changer because nobody likes the school run traffic i think nobody. that uh, this, this this afternoon's uh uh, conversation has been brilliant so James and, and Greg we're gonna have you back uh, James fantastic because uh, your side what's very clear for me is the partnership working is essential the, the, the councils have got to change the relationship with their contractors uh, and uh, and start to push through some changes and they will change again you know one of the things I think that we're all realizing is that we've got to make the changes we can now and then when the opportunity comes along, we've got to make more changes that will come along uh, further down the line. Um, and uh, what I'm really interested in, something that I think we should try to explore, is how we encourage this modal shift and get people to start realising that uh, building back better and going back to where we were is a wasted opportunity of something that's naturally come up that we would never have had. Never. And uh, getting people to communicate. But you're also right, Greg, that change is going to be quite painful. And in London the shift for the hospitality sector and uh, the, all the sandwich shops. Although I think if you can walk for five minutes and pass three Pret-a-Manger's, 
maybe they've got a few too many uh, branches in London. But, you know, I'm sure they'll be uh, on the uh, phone straight away telling us that uh, they're just there to supply what's needed by the clients. But there is a, a really big shift coming up. I want to move us on a little bit. Uh, the one thing, uh, Johnny, I didn't hear from you is that apparently MI5, uh, MI6 and James Bond uh, are now getting terribly environmental. I don't know whether you read the story that MI6 will now be spying on the major countries of the world to make sure that they're giving the right and truthful data behind their climate change work. Who knew that 007 was going green? But there oh, we go. Be, yeah, yeah. Not too sure that will make to the cinema, will it? I think that might be a direct release to... Uh... Well, it'd just be nice to see the film, wouldn't it? That's yeah. been sitting there for over a year, waiting for us to go and see it. But uh, we're going to move on to uh, our two regular things. Uh, and uh, the Climate Hero of the Month, Vicky, is a posthumous award. Yes. Um, what, obviously, we were all struck this month by the, by the death of, of His Royal Highness Prince Philip, um, who, by the way, has a glacier named after him in Antarctica. Um, what I think we're all sort of quite shocked about is that is that the number of people who who believe they understand and know about the environment and, and conservation, how little we knew about how much he did um, in in the world of, of conservation. I mean, it was it was the 1950s that he started talking about the greenhouse effect when it was not seen as as, as even being a thing. Um, so, you know, obviously we, we know about his time as, um, as the, the first president of the World Wildlife Fund and he carried on an honorary basis right up to the present day. But um, his relationship with David Attenborough, which is fascinating. Um, but I think that one of the things that struck me when I watched his funeral and, and you know, that was a, a, a real moment in time and I, I, I love I, I wanted to ask whether the uh, the Land Rover was electric, but you know what a great Land Rover we have for for his um, his funeral was. If you listened to the service itself, um, the reading that he chose was all about nature. It was all about the natural world. It referred to rainbows and glaciers and hailstones, something I've never ever heard. That sort of finding that content. Um, just gave me the, the impression of how deep his love of nature uh, went. And he, he had said, um, and this was, I got this from the World Wildlife Fund's website, that if nature doesn't survive, neither will man. And I mean, that's such a profound statement to sort of say, we have no prior right to this earth over the animals. And I, I think perhaps if we remember just simple things like that, um, we would all be better for it. So Johnny is agreeing with me. So I, I think am you know. indeed, yeah. I, and it was for me. It was. It was. I was struck, and and it, you know, it's sad. I feel sad for the the death and sad for the family. And I feel, you know, personally sad that I I didn't know about that. Mm. And, you know, his his son and uh, Prince Charles and all his amazing work that he does for conservation. You hear about, but um, maybe it's a generational thing. But it that was lost on me. So it was you know sad, but but very warm to hear what an amazing you know career he had in in conservation um and and should be celebrated as we're celebrating him here um and it's also i i i know that i've spoken to a few politicians over the years who always go on about the custodians of estates you see how i avoided the sort of negative side of that and he was the the um, he was responsible for Windsor Great Park and all the work that he did there over the years to make sure that that park can carried on uh, investing in the future and and um, I think that's amazing. But that thought that um, there are you know it's not about a four year political cycle, it's about a hundred years and more. And I think that that's one of the challenges that our generation are going to face more and more and more is get over the four year uh, voting cycle. You've got to do something here that's going to last 100, 200 years or we're in serious trouble. Uh, and talking about uh, something uh, that's caused a bit of a storm. Now, I just want to point out, just because I want to make Keith's life easier. But when we talk about hypocrites, we are with tongue in cheek pointing out that sometimes even when you're hearted in the right place, when you're seeking to do the right thing by the world, you can cause a complete nightmare, a storm in a beehive. 
This is uh, an M and F storm in a beehive. It's not your normal beehive problems. This is not that Vicky Slade just upset all her neighbours with her beehives. This is one of the great retailers of this country trying to do the right thing uh, as part of their five year farming with nature program. So everything about this is this person got up and wrote this because they wanted to do good. The only problem is with their um, uh, beehives that are all over the country at 25 different farms so that you can wake up to the best ever honey. Uh, they're using a bee that's not from the UK. Uh, and in fact, they've missed, according to the uh, Bugs Life charity. I love that. There's a film called Bugs Life. I didn't realise that uh, it was a charity as well. Uh, they, they, they've got the wrong bee. <laughs> and, uh, which it must be must be devastating if you've worked very hard got all your marketing together uh, and also what's fantastic about bugs life is an, another element that i've just been reading it because I, I i was late for the planning meeting everyone i admit it and i got given this to do uh, as a penance but there were 270 different bee species in this country and they haven't been recorded since 1990 so i don't know what you've been doing johnny why have you been out there checking how many bees there are um <laughs> Uh, but there's a real decline in our own um, bees in this country. And so, Marks and Spencers, we love that you're trying it, but you do win the hypocrite of the month because all of your good work has been shot down in flames because you didn't quite get the message. But then it's an M&S beehive nightmare. And that's very special. Um, Can I just just get just on that? Yeah, there's, there's a, let's just take some positives out of this, okay? Yeah. First and foremost, I'm sure M&S honey is fantastic. I'm sure. But just to put a little pl plug out for local artisan beekeepers, of which we've run out of this year. So if you want any from me, you've got to wait till October. Local honey is known to do wonders for your hay fever. So. You know, if you've worried about supporting the M&S honey or, and, and you want to, you know, you've got hay fever, go find a beekeeper at the end of your road because that's the very best honey you can have. And if no. you want to do, if you want to do right by bees, obviously last week was Earth Day. Five amazing themes. Oh, why does the phone always ring? Uh, five amazing themes on um, for Earth Day. And one of them is about this citizen scientist. And one of the things you can do on the um, on the citizen scientist website is you can actually plot bees. So, you know, you can find out whether in your area bees are, are, have a problem. Now, Nick, oh. I'm, I'm surprised that you missed that uh, Marks and Spencer's sustainability program was called Plan A. Uh, and do you not think they now need a Plan B? Well, uh, if they do this again, they'll need to see Anna D and an E. But, you know... <laughs> One of the things that uh, I'm very aware of as well is that people are now looking at everyone and you've got to be really, really careful. And uh, you know, from our little world, which uh, at Kratos, we've been working and looking at how we're going to contribute. Uh, it makes you really realise that you know, before you open your mouth and you stand up and say, I'm doing this, uh, think it through the best you can, because people are out there to challenge you. The Guardian newspaper on this occasion, but it's right for us all to be challenged. And it's a really big task ahead of us. But yeah, that doesn't stop us from having a go and moving forward. Ab absolutely, Nick. I think there's just sort of one final thing for me is that uh, you, you know you have to be prepared to take the brickbats because doing nothing ain't an option either. Uh, and you know, the, uh, I, I recalled in our first um, program of doing this uh, that that uh, there was um, uh, the ten point government plan for the green industrial revolution had been. You know, part, uh, uh, the minister is being questioned about it and the journalist had said, oh, well, you know, uh, it's all too complicated and you've got 10 points. I just need to talk about five. You know, it's that. <laughs> so and you've just heard in the transport conversation how interrelated everything is. Mm -hmm. It's not just about technology. Yes, technology is going to be very important, but it's also about behavior. It's also about infrastructure. It's also about adaptation and resilience and what we do in terms of contracts and commercial and asset management. All of that sort of stuff needs to come together. And it's no good us just sort of waiting because we've got, we've got to solve Johnny's sanctuary of elephants before we get on and do stuff. We need to be doing stuff now. 
And so, you know, whatever is good, let's get on and do. And if we get it wrong, then we hold our hands up and carry on and do the next thing. Uh, and I, t I totally agree with that. I just wanted to sort of address that, that this is being, uh, we, we're putting these together as Stantec and Kratos each month. Uh, we thoroughly enjoy them. And Greg and James joining us, thank you so much. You really make an impact on uh, us and all the work that we're doing. So even just talking to us is great. But we've got lots of people watching in now. And we've got to encourage people to go forward. I ask again, I in, invite you all to come forward. Uh, if you're watching this live or you're watching this on the recorded version, please come forward and tell us about your own journeys, what you're trying to do. And for the local politicians, this cannot be ignored. National politicians, just take a chill pill. While you're out on the stump, there is a lot of people who realise that the clock is ticking and we do have to start making a difference. So please come and join us and make a difference and get learning as we go along because it ain't getting any better. And James and Greg, you've made a real impact on me today. So thank you so much for your time. We'll see you again soon. Next month, uh, we're back uh, earlier on the 24th of May because it's a bank holiday and we're just going to go driving around uh, in our petrol head cars, aren't we? On that, day? No, we're not. Uh, but we'll see you on the 24th of May. Until then, thank you so much for joining us. Goodbye.